Okay. Yes. That's what mamas do. <laughs> okay. Okay, so good morning, everybody. It's so great that you're here with us this morning, um, taking time out of your Saturday to join the conversation of Evolving Rehab Together. So the reason why we're having this call today is uh, Nick and I have been hearing similar, well, the same stories from um, health professionals and physios specifically for quite a long time now. Um, the story is uh, as one of confusion and a, a little bit of frustration with what's happening in, in, your, in, your, in your field and how to go about making the shift to something that is actually going to help people uh, long-term to recover and reclaim and understand how to take full control of, of our health. Um, and a lot of the stories are around not actually being able to, feeling handcuffed around actually doing that. So we thought it was time to bring us all together to have a conversation about this and see what some possible solutions are. And so um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Nick and he's gonna facilitate the call for us. The format will be that each person who would like to speak will speak for about six minutes or so and we'll, have, we'll give you a, a warning time, uh, a message, not a warning. You must stop speaking now. Um, <laughs> Cue the music. <laughs> <laughs> so here, comes, here comes the hook. Um, and then we'll have an open discussion for a time afterwards. And, um, and we'll be about 90 minutes. What we don't get finished today, we'll continue on another call if we, if we think it's necessary. So I'll give it over to you, Nick. Awesome. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, yeah, big thanks to Ruth. She's kind of the like coordination ninja that actually organizes these things and does all the work to put them together. So thank you, Ruth, for doing that because it probably wouldn't happen if it wasn't for you. Uh, so hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Nick. I'm the chief nerd at TFC. And uh, I also want to thank you for all taking time out of your Saturday to tune in today um, because I think conversations like this are really important um, for solving problems. And the current state of health, I think, is a pretty darn big problem. So um, like Ruth said, the objective of this session is to sort of gather a bunch of people currently working in the rehab space together uh, so we can all kind of share our stories briefly and also share sort of our challenges and frustrations so that we can then uh, sort of collectively brainstorm solutions to those challenges. Um, and so we're going to start, like Ruth said, by taking six minutes each to share who we are, uh, where we call home, how we define health, our perspective on our current field and some challenges. And I know that's a lot to cover in six minutes. So please do your best. Um, I'm going to keep track of time. So my watch will be at five minutes, 30 seconds. And I'll just say 30 seconds, which is sort of a nudge to uh, start wrapping up. So after everyone's had their turn, uh, we'll have kind of a 30 minute discussion um, to kind of talk about a few different questions. And uh, yeah. If you're all good, let's get started. And Jennifer, you're just, you're the first one on my screen. So if you'd like to kick us off. I was terrified. I knew you were going to pick me. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> no, Everyone's I'm not terrified. <laughs> okay. I know I'm teasing. Okay. So I'm Jennifer Comer and I'm chiming in from Tucson, Arizona. Um, I'm a physical therapist and a Pilates instructor. And um, I, uh, I started the foot nerd program in October of I want to say it was 2019. Time has become a very strange thing lately. So I kind of can't remember. I have lapses and when what started. So um, I think that's when I started. It was um, a very seamless connection. So some of what I feel like probably all of us are, are going to say has to do with things even before the pandemic, but now we're piling that on top of it as complications in our, in our, um, in our professions. But um, the first question was to describe health. And um, I, I mean, I feel like you could have come up with 20 different definitions. Um, so I, I stopped, you know, really worrying too much about it and just went with what, what is it? And so um, for me, health describes the state of a person being an optimal balance of wellness and not simply surviving, but thriving in not only body, but mind and spirit. So, um, which is very different than fitness. You know, it's, we get so hung up on, on fitness um, and I think health is something um, different, which, which incorporates fitness, but, but is definitely different. And I think um, that mind piece of it has become so much more prominent um, to everyone now with the pandemic as well. So 
so we see how that affects our, our actual wellness and keeping us from out of a sick state um, and actually being healthy. So in my profession, I feel, um, so as, as a physical therapist in the States, um, it's a lovely profession and I, I love it so much. I cherish it, but I'm not really that proud of it right now. Um, I think I, I tried to start making the changes uh, for myself um, probably like in 2010 when I started doing things outside of the, the clinic. You know, I started taking my profession and doing, um, doing things outside of the insurance, basically. And so those handcuffs that Ruth mentioned, um, I started trying to free myself from those, but you, don't, you can't only just free yourself. If the community is not being freed of them, it's really hard to move in that direction as well. So um, working, you know, not only to wrap my brain around the concept and how to work, how to work that in that direction, but also how to educate people into how that is a good and healthy way to go. So I would like to see my profession um, come together on the spectrum, like we in so many areas of the world and opinion right now. But, you know, you just got that clinic where they're like, you're a shoulder and that's all that gets treated versus, you know, this is your health and it's ongoing and everything's connected and trying to bring those, those two things um, together. And then challenges in my practice right now are, are actually getting people to, um, not getting people, wanting my community to um, have better understandings of the virus and the vaccines, because there's a lot of perceptions that, you know, just it, it's either a do or a don't based on those things as opposed to reality. Um, and then also how to place value on well care as opposed to sick care you know how do we work more into preventative and i know that's just by cheating and looking forward at some of our discussion i know that's part of what um we're going to discuss is that uh how do we do more prehab and that's really what i've been focusing on for years and i've got i've got some people to to understand that and work i mean everybody who comes to to my studio pretty much thinks that but it's not a a well accepted um concept, particularly with the other practitioners, <laughs> which can slow things down um, quite a bit. So, so I, I have a physical therapy and Pilates studio is, is what I do, and I'm the only one in it. So I miss my other professionals. So you guys, you guys might be it. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for sharing that. And I, I think mm -hmm. when you mentioned Thrive, I think Thrive is a word that uh, we don't use in our like cultural lexicon, but like, that's a really good word, right? Because our default state is to be in a sense of ease. Um, and right now the default mm. state for pretty much everyone in the Western world is dis-ease, whether that's mentally, physically, spiritually, um, and you don't know what you don't know. And so if you, you know, I think if there's this narrative where like, we're just not supposed to feel great. Like that's just the default thinking for a lot of people. And so there's no reason mm -hmm. to actually inquire. And so like, you know, we have to go pretty deep, like with conversations with people. And that's why I love starting with people's definition of health, because if they think health is one thing and we think health is something different, we're not even aiming at the same target or speaking the same language. Right. And I think with health professionals, we need to speak the same language and kind of like be on the same page. Right. So uh, amazing. Thank you, Jennifer, for sharing that. Mm -hmm. um, You're welcome. Di Diego, do you want to go next? Hi. Yeah, sure. Awesome. Uh, well, hello, everyone. First of all, I want to express like how excited and happy I am for inviting me to this to this debate. Like it's really awesome. And um, well, <laughs> well, I'm Diego Robert. I'm from Mexico. I'm living in Veracruz, Mexico. Yeah. Um, well, the first the first question that you asked was, what would you define? Uh, health into sentences. So for me, health is, it's really a journey of self-discovery, right? Like I believe that if we learn to know ourselves, we can like try to find each day, like the real or the truest motivations to keep doing it. And if we arrive to that point of knowing ourselves, like we can establish like balance between the internal and external environment. And that, I, I believe that like that's the key, not only to our wellness, but 
like the wellness of the whole world, you know? So yeah, I, I, that's why, like how I define health. Um, like second point, what is your perspective about, about what's happening in your field? Well, I, I have the opportunity to talk a little bit about this topic with Ruth. And I was like, oh, like really, really getting out of my head because that's a thing that I've been uh, like thinking about, like maybe since I uh, entered to my, my career that at physiotherapy and manual, manual therapy also. And well, I believe that we are missing two essential uh, topics or things in, in, in this question. The first is, I, I, I want to believe that we need to stop prioritizing like protocols about everything. Like I'm not saying the protocols are bad, but I think that we are tend to, to lean so much weight on them that we are missing like the individualism in each of the therapeutic treatments. So yeah, uh, well, in the clinics that I used to work uh, in Mexico City, like we, are, we were trying to, to, to make it feel better, the people uh, based on, on a protocol. And I was like, no, <laughs> that's, I, I think that's not the way because a protocol can be useful for one person, but maybe not for the other one, right? Uh, and the second, uh, second point is the misconception, the misconception of humanism. Um, and I'm not saying like we are bad with people, right? Uh, but like a professor uh, of mine said me once, I, and I'm one, going to quote this one, and I, I don't know if it's like the right uh, translation, but I will try to, to do it in <laughs> the, right word, the right words in English because in Spanish it sounds, sounds beautiful, but maybe here it doesn't <laughs> sound so beautiful. But yeah, it's, uh, we're not just a bag of flesh and bones. Like we as a human has, have the social, emotional, psychological necessities uh, in order to function. Uh, so yeah, and here is also when we can introduce the, the thing that you, you establish super well, that it's like playfulness, because uh, yeah, humans need to have that true motivations and want to do the, the re rehabilitation every day. So if we introduce like the play, playfulness in, in the treatment, the probabilities are pretty much higher to do it, right? So yeah, that's, that's a, the two things that I, I perceive is happening. And in the last question, like this hardest scenario for me that I'm facing, it's, it was really, really is that like, we have to, to start to create a culture of want, like people wanting to be okay, to, to want to be uh, feeling good. Because if we are not finding those motivations, like we can, well, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, like apply it so well because we are not, yeah, we are not uh, changing those habits. Like if I'm uh, making a person feel better, well, maybe it can last two months and then it returns. So, well, yeah, I think that's it. Amazing. That's uh, <laughs> perfect timing. My watch just went off. And by the way, your English is very good. It's way better. Thank than you very English, much. So it's uh, <laughs> very, very impressive. Um, yeah, I think you, those are great points. And, and some of those perspectives are like, were kind of uh, kind of new to me in terms of how you worded it. And I think fundamentally, it's like, if we don't change health, the culture around health, and if we don't put it out there that people that it's like within access to people. Cause I think people feel like health is this ephemeral thing that they can't get to. Um, 
and that plays into the decreased motivation to even try and learn or approach that because they just don't feel it's tangible or realistic to get to. Mm. Uh, and I think that's all based on this um, sort of faulty definition of health where it's like a certain look or a certain lifestyle. And if that doesn't resonate with them, then they're like, well, I can't get there. And so you're right. I think if we, if we make it a playful journey, um, and I love that you said it's just self-exploration because I really, I, I also think that that's what it is. And, you know, we talk about, you know, we don't really, I always think that we don't really teach health, right? Even in quote unquote health professional programs, we don't teach health, but also only 10% of health can be taught. The rest needs to be learned and it can't be given to you. And so we need a motivation for our, the people we work with to want to engage in the learning process of health, but we also need the guides or the professionals to also want to engage in that. Because if you are taught everything, but you didn't learn anything yourself about the process of health, then maybe you're not the best person to be able to guide others to do that. Um, so amazing. Thank you, Diego. Um, and Linda, you want to go next? Linda, Linda Ring? Yes, amazing. sure. So um, first of all, I'll introduce myself. My name is Linda and I go way back with Ruth, 25 years or more maybe. Um, mm -hmm. And she's been telling me about this program since she got involved and it's been very intriguing. And I think the reason why she thought of me is because I am a physical therapist and I'm experiencing all the things that you all are talking about that sort of that underlying disconnect um, with what we were taught to do in school and then what we have to live within in the regulations in the you know in the insurance system in order to just try to you know do our profession um so the first so i i live in connecticut i'm in pomfret connecticut which is the very very northeast corner you know very close to the massachusetts and rhode island border um and i started off in a in a intense neuro rehab setting which i really enjoyed um, and then I went to outpatient for several years and then um, I got really burned out there because of, again, the insurance and the requirement just to try to make money for the clinic. You know, I was seeing 14, 16 or more people a day with, you know, maybe 10 minutes of direct uninterrupted time with them. Um, no time to do all the paperwork, which is what you have to do to support the regulation. And I just was like, this is not at all what I went to school for. Um, so the next setting I went into is the one I'm in right now, which is home health. And it has its disadvantages for sure, but um, it's, it was very freeing for me because you, can, you only have to see five or six people in a day. And when you're with them, you, you get to give them your undivided attention. And um, I was already, obviously, as I said, sort of feeling this um, dilemma, you know, about a frustration about knowing the potential of what we could do as people and what we could do for people to help them, but living within this box. And so here you are in someone's home and no one's really looking at you. <laughs> so you have a little more freedom to be creative and do whatever you want. Um, so I still find that I am at a little bit of a loss or not more recently, but in the beginning, you know, um, in the first several years that I was doing home health, I was still sort of at a loss of, you know, well, how creative can I get? You're working with people who have just been discharged from the hospital, so they're not well, um, but you could get creative, like um, just do any kind of movement with them and call it therapy. So long as you could break down on the paperwork, you know, to satisfy insurance, of how this is a skill that I need to do with somebody and not anybody else, at least initially. So I've done things like dance with people, you know, or get their we out and, and, and put a game on this balance and work on that and have fun. And those are the moments that I loved working with people and being in the home um, because they were, they were just fun. And, and they all of a sudden had a smile on their face. And, and those were my most productive moments. But it, to get back to your questions, Ruth, as far as like how I define health, you know, and all the sort of change and evolution I've been going through, I, I, I define it as sort of being able to create a lifestyle that supports and allows your body to function the way it was designed to function, which is really at a st in a state of health. Um, so a lot goes into that, but, you know, I never really looked at it that way before. I always looked at it in this very traditional um compartmentalized way. And now I feel like, you know, it really, it, it is this comprehensive thing. Everything is connected naturally, you know, that's how we start off. And then as we go through life, you know, things kind of break it away and 
you're compartmentalized um, with everything that you do. Um, and then of course, as an adult, you tend to get busier and busier and it's harder to um, make time to just live that comprehensive, to, to address all those needs, you know, in a very holistic, comprehensive way. So that's how I define health as being able to live a, a lifestyle that sort of facilitates your body to function at its optimal way, which is how we're designed. Um, and there's very little resistance when you kind of give your give yourself that that foundation. You know, your body will just take off and do what it's supposed to do, which is really awesome. Um, in my field, I feel like in in well in home care, um, but really across the profession, you know, we as people have said, we're sort of reacting to things instead of preventing things. So that's sort of the the most basic thing. We're just treating people once they're already in a state of un you know unhealth, like they're unhealthy, they're, they've got a shoulder issue. A, a, in home health, you know, we're looking also at like the medical because people are just out of the hospital. So we're having to work within their cardiac issues or their pulmonary issues or, but what we also see a lot of is, um, I think Diego mentioned this, is that that social aspect, their emotional aspect, their psychological factors, you know, their whole family dynamics, you know, the state in which they're living in and how that's affecting their health. And so it just drives home the point that all that's so connected, but yet nobody else is thinking this way. So you're trying to come in as this one person and try to kind of create a care plan where you can treat all of that. Um, but really, you know, you've got the pressures of you can only do four visits or six visits and then you got to get out. Um, so it's, it's difficult. And I, so I think that, you know, the biggest challenges I'm finding in my rehab profession is insurance and regulation. 30 seconds. Okay. Yeah. Is the insurance and regulation. And like I said, it's just a broken system. So it's hard for me to have sort of this very um, different way of thinking that feels so right and natural and normal. It's hard to take that into my work and implement it because you're against all of those rules. And I've said for a long time, like it's the regulations that are going to drive me right out of this profession. Cause it just, it just, it makes it very frustrating. It doesn't feel grounded. You, you, you know, you can't, you can't present this holistic wellness, you know, program or package to people. And it's, it's hard, it's hard, it's a hard sell. Yeah. So that, that's where I sit. Awesome. Thank you for that. And I think, yeah, I think Buckminster Fuller, uh, to his quote, where it says, instead of fighting the existing system, create a different one and make the old one obsolete. And I think trying to fight insurance companies or the whole, I mean, I live in Canada, so it's a different, um, system here but there's really we don't have a health system we have a sick care system it's the same kind of thread just just p different people pay and you know instead of insurance providers it's people paying with their taxes um but it's equally as ineffective and i think when you talked about the amount of patients that you see um or that you were seeing in in previous work environments you know for me it brings up like what is the optimal caring capacity as a uh health guide let's call it which encompasses all the rehab professions that we're talking about what's the optimal carrying capacity for your health as a provider and for you to provide the most effective care to the people you work with. Um, Cause I've thought about this quite a bit and it's significantly lower than what I would have guessed. And it's obviously multiple, like multiple orders of magnitude lower than what's currently done in, um, in most clinics. But this whole concept of like, what's the most people that you can see per day without burning yourself out while delivering effective care because we all we talk about is efficiency right it's like how do you see whether it's uh incentivized financially it's how do you see the most people in the shortest period of time and if all you do is focus on efficiency without even considering effectiveness what's the point if you see 20 people but you're not able to help them at all it's like you've been real efficient with seeing people but you have not been effective at like enhancing health and i think part of it is like the whole like knowing on our end, like what are we comfortable with? How much energy do we have to give each day? Because that's almost like the starting point of then, okay, well, this is how much we have to charge per visit, per session to make to make an income to support ourselves. And this is, you know, like we can go from there. So I think that may be the, the whole healthy caring capacity for both the person receiving care and the person giving care um, will be a good discussion point at the end. So thanks for that, Linda. Uh, Linda Drummond, you want to go next? Oh, I think you're muted, Linda. Better? Can you hear me? Better. Yeah, we got you. Go for it. Awesome. Thanks for telling me. 
Um, I'm from Canada as well, um, Manitoba near Winnipeg, center of Canada. Um, I am a physio as well. Um, this has been awesome hearing everybody's stories. Um, um, and I echo them and rah, rah, all of them. Um, for me, um, I did not put a lot of weight into thinking about what health meant to me. This is such a, um, a new thing for me. It was just something, something out of reach or it was a look or it was um, just not something that I, I thought of in, in the forefront a lot. And so this has been um, very helpful to start processing this. Um, for me, um, going through the Foot Nerd program and learning the five pillars of health um, um, at its basic level, functioning optimally in all of those areas, but just as of late and through my health journey, um, something that came to mind was just thrive, the word thrive, thriving um, and flourishing regardless of all the crap that's going around um, around us, re um, regardless of the circumstances, um, thriving and flourishing, um, not waiting for the perfect um, to be happy, to be healthy, um, that direction of, of health. Um, and the other thing that I've been battling with and um, wrestling with is having value and having a purpose and that's where I feel um, in this area and with this um, um, topic um, I don't feel a value um, to people in my job um, so that's I think that's something that's so very important to have um, for health to be to live with a purpose and have uh, meaning um, and to feel connected to yourself, to others, um, and the world is something that um, I feel that on my personal journey, I'm seeing the massive importance. Um, I hadn't been connected with Slack during my journey, and for some weird glitch and um, I reached out to Ruth and just feel like um, it, yeah, I was missing that. It's, it's, I'm realizing the massive importance of that connection. So that's a huge part of, of health um, for me. Um, my struggles, I, I am a physio. I graduated a long time ago, but um, only worked for a short amount of time and um, returned, worked in the hospital and decided it was probably for about four or five years, but I was, I was off for, 12 in that little in that time and returned by pulling out a dusty tote of um, old notes and studied those notes and passed the national exam um, nothing new nothing changed just passed that and carried on and and while well, I was a physio <laughs> but I worked for um, probably four or five years in a hospital it was it was great it was fine but decided I needed a change. So I have just started at a private practice in January and am overwhelmed. Um, and that was part of the reason why I reached out, wondering if everyone else was having these issues and these struggles. And um, so I am very thankful for this opportunity to talk to everybody um, because I felt uh, very alone. Um, in my thinking, in how I treat and just felt very different. And um, health just was not part of the process at all, wasn't part of the other physios thinking, wasn't a part of, isn't a part of the patient's thinking. So yeah, I just felt very alone. Um, I feel like Nick has said, it's, it's a sick care system um, and people are coming to be fixed um, and want me to tell them what to do. And um, I'm struggling very hard with that being new, feeling wildly overwhelmed that I need to have all of the answers. So I'm voraciously trying to read and, and input all of this knowledge, but um, yeah, struggling that, that that's maybe not the best way. It's um, the wisdom I need to um, make come out of those people, right? Um, 
this another struggle I have uh, with working in private practice is meeting the people where they are. Um, they're not, I'm finding people aren't um, interested in health. They just want that fix and um, just not knowing where to go with that and how to, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's just struggling a lot with that. Um, I think- 30 seconds, Linda. Sure, I think um, there's a, a huge potential in, um, asking more questions. That last um, video that you guys put out was just um, I, very eye-opening. And I think that's um, a good way to, um, to start. I just, I'm very uh, interested in how we're all going to work this out and um, figure that out. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that. And I think, I think it is over, like, I think everyone that goes into some form of work where you're working with other humans to help them um, goes in because you care, right? You care, you want to help, you want to find meaningful work in helping others um, do something positive in their lives. And I think that immediately, and in physio school, I know that that was like the programming was you exist to do things for other people. You exist to fix other people. Essentially, the, the underlying tone is like, other people's health is your responsibility. That's kind of like what get, gets given to you in the underlying tone of everything you learn. That's why you're paying all this money to learn it. And, you know, this frustration with the fact that, like you said, Linda, people aren't interested in health because their, their understanding of health is so, is so non-existent that it's not even, it seems like too big of a thing to even talk about, right? It's like, no, I just, I want to get rid of this shoulder pain. That's my only problem. Fix it for me. And when you care about people and you take, you, your, your heart is there to take responsibility and help this person, but they're not even on your side, then it's like trying to run uphill and as you, as you get higher and higher, the oxygen gets thinner and thinner and you struggle more and more and you care because you care enough to keep going because you're like, well, this is my job. This is my purpose. And it's just like everything fights against you. The more you care, the harder it is on you because it seems like nothing's really changing. And I think part of the solution to that is like we need to find ways to bring up the topic of taking response, the individual responsibility piece, right? Like having people be as interested in their health as you uh, yes. so that at least you have an ally instead of like working against someone. And, you know, obviously there's a whole world of medicine and rehab that they've interacted in the past that probably has never brought that notion up. And so this is like a really foreign thing. Um, and it, you have to just ask a lot of questions to find out what is the best inroad um, to people in general or, and, you know, this individual in particular. So, um, yeah, I think a lot of your struggles are resonated by a lot of people, whether they come outright and say it or not. Like I, I was hanging out with some people I went to physio school with a couple weekends ago and like half of them didn't want to be physios anymore. And I was like, this is such a wasted opportunity because these people are amazingly smart. They want to help and yet they feel helpless to do anything. And so they're looking for other jobs. It's like, this, this, there's a big opportunity to kind of like basically change what we view as the scope of practice as a health professional and like moving away from just being a physio serving to see people for injuries towards like I actually want to help people feel better in on all five pillars or, or better yet understand health not take responsibility for their help but help them understand health so um, amazing thank you for that Linda. Uh, Ruth do you want to go or should we go through everyone else and then we'll go last. Okay, awesome. Uh, Layla, would you like to go? Yeah. Um, I also just want to say, like, I feel very lucky to be here. This is such a cool experience to me. And I can't believe, like, I'm one of the few people that are here. So thank you so Thanks much. Um, okay, so my name is Layla. I am actually a student physical therapist. Um, I go to Arcadia University in near Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, and I'm also a dual degree. So I am studying for my master's in public health as well. So um, this is interesting to me on both fronts. Um, so health, I don't wanna repeat a lot of what we said, but basically I think of it as like overall well-being and homeostasis of the body um, in all aspects and 
I think in this country and um, especially like we define it as a lack of sickness and that lack of sickness, um, even if there is sickness, there's still like the caveat of, well, it's not really like serious until it's serious. Um, so until you can like see it or until it like very much changes like your daily activities. Um, so what's happening in my field? So for physical therapy, I do think that there is starting to be a shift, a very slow shift towards like patient-centered care, holistic approaches, um, like the HMO programs and everything. But I, I do think it's very slow. Um, and I can only speak about like my program, the experiences that I've had in physical therapy um, as a patient and just like my rotations and everything. And um, a big part of what we learn in my program is education. And I personally think education is the best tool that we have as PTs for our patients. Um, kind of like what we've mentioned uh, educating about prevention, educating about, you know, empowering the patient and getting them to take uh, a hands-on or take like a more like initiative type of approach to their, to their health. Um, yeah, but I still don't think that PT has started focusing on prevention yet. Um, like we've talked about, like it's, it's all about treating the individual condition or diagnosis that we're, we're told to treat um, secondary and tertiary prevention. Um, but physical therapy is just a part of the bigger healthcare system. So I don't, I don't think it's to blame or anything. Um, so yeah, if we can shift like towards wellness checks, the same way that we have a physical every year with our family care doctor, um, doing that with physical therapists and psychologists, like, I think that's a better way to kind of structure the system. Um, in terms of public health, uh, I love <laughs> what I study in my master's program. And I think that's where um, I almost quit PT schools to only <laughs> do public health because I was just so inspired of like how we can make change through public health. Um, so I think really like utilizing community-based programs is a great way to be able to make that change on like a bigger scale. Um, cause it's just, it's as a whole is more focused on population, right? So then you're always going to be looking more upstream and emphasizing primary prevention. Um, some challenges in PT. I think that there are good PTs and I think that there are bad PTs just like any profession. And, um, a lot of patients, like I hear them say like that they've had bad experiences. They don't believe in physical therapy. Um, they don't want to go back to, you know, seeing a physical therapist again, which is just like really disheartening. And especially when a patient comes to you and says that it's like, okay, well, we're, <laughs> this is a great way to start our relationship. <laughs> um, and they have like super high expectations for quick progress and rehab. And um, sometimes they only give you like one to two sessions before they already like mentally make the decision of like, PT is not going to help. I'm not going back. And so it's like, what can I do in the one to two sessions um, that can kind of like convince this patient that, that like we're here to work together. Like we can get them better. It, you just got to trust me a little bit. Um, and I think that's where the education piece is really important. Um, uh, like Linda said, a lot of patients really uh, focus on like having your hands on them and fixing the problem um, as opposed to like them kind of becoming independent in, in their own plan of care. And I do think that there have been a lot of introductions of cash-based PT, which is really great um, because then you get to spend like an hour one-on-one -on -one with a patient but the costs of a one-on-one -on -one session like that are $150 on average minimum. Um, and one of my passions is, is serving the underserved community and marginalized communities. And because they're the ones disproportionately affected by disease, 30 seconds. 30 seconds later. <laughs> yeah, you got it. Um, so they're the ones disproportionately affected by disease, but it's like, how can we expect these people um, 
who are just oppressed in our systems and just really need our help. But like we're charging them $150 to have like that one-on-one -on -one service. Like it just, it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense. And it's not, we're never going to be able to reach those people in that kind of system. Um, so like I said, I think community-based programs um, would be a great way to kind of get involved. Mm. Thanks for that. And it's very interesting having someone who's a student in a rehab program because it's a different perspective, right? Like most of us graduated a while ago, changes might be happening. We, not, we might not know a huge amount about it. Although I still try and speak with students as frequently as I can to get a pulse on like, is it changing? What are you learning that's new? Um, and really with the Footner program, we tried to create a program that was about being healthy, not learning health. And so like you actually have to do things. You have, like there's projects that are really hard for some people. And I think there's some really big value to that because you learn things you can never be taught in, in words or theory by just going through and troubleshooting it yourself. Um, and I think what you bring up about underserved populations really emphasizes the opportunity we have with technology. Um, because if health is really about understanding, uh, if it's really about awareness and having some basic tools, but then taking responsibility and implementing those tools, um, you know, we can create a video now and have it be distributed to everyone with a phone. And even the underserved populations have access to the internet and probably have an iPad computer or phone. And if we can reach them with basic understanding so that they can have a better grasp of how to take care of themselves, even within whatever circumstances they're in, uh, that's a big opportunity, right? And, and the whole thing about the price, like if you really rewind things, why do we have to charge so much? Well, it's because we pay for expensive degrees and we have to pay those degrees down. Um, and it's also because those degrees only take a certain amount of people. Therefore, there's a scarcity created of the amount of helpers available to help. Not only do the helpers not really learn how to help, but what they paid for their degree and the scarcity that creates, creates an environment where it's really expensive to talk to someone about your health. And if that's, a, that's an artificial construct based on those elements, right? Like if you, know, if you could take an online program for a couple thousand dollars, to learn about health by being healthy, you don't have to charge, you can charge like 60 bucks and work with someone for an hour and you're not, ha you don't have the pressure, the business pressure or the uh, financial burden of the degree you paid for to have to pay down. And I think that's a, there's a, there's a dynamic there that I think can be addressed and allow way more people to engage in the health space as guides um, because they don't need this expensive piece of paper to, sh to say that they know the stuff. So I think there's some interesting things that we could unpack there. And, and hopefully this, you know, this is the first of potentially several more. If we do this, like every couple months, we have a conversation. And I think there's very, there's so much power in multiple brains sharing different perspectives and having different frameworks for coming up with solutions that we probably would not think of independently, but collectively we can be like, oh, that's really interesting. Um, so amazing. Thanks for sharing that, Leila. Uh, Nick, you wanna go? All right, so I'm Nick Sinkowitz. Um, I'm a physical therapist in Salisbury, Massachusetts, so about 45 minutes north of Boston. Um, and I work at a small privately owned outpatient clinic that, interestingly enough, following Layla, we are transitioning to a cash-based clinic. Um, so we were in network with all insurances. And now we're just in network with two and dropping them by the summer. So we're facing a bunch of these kind of transitionary challenges that I'll, I'll kind of touch on towards the end, but um, it's an interesting kind of, uh, you know, thing to bring to the table, especially following what Layla said about the underserved populations, because that's one of our biggest things is we feel like we're not being able to see or, you know, help everyone that we could help before, but we're able to help the people we are seeing much more effectively. So kind of going back to what you were saying, Nick, about efficiency versus effectiveness. So we feel like we're much more effective now, even though we've lost some of that efficiency. Um, but starting with the first question, um, I, I just believe health is really finding and, and fluidly maintaining a balance between spirit, mind, and body. Um, I went to Springfield College in Springfield, Mass, and their, their kind of logo is a triangle and they have spirit, mind, body all in the point. So I always got to bring that in. But, um, and I know, um, uh, I think Linda had said it at the beginning, or someone said it at the beginning, spirit, mind, and body. Um, but I think that will look pretty similar for all humans, but 
it's going to be very unique to each individual in their kind of situation, their context, all, all of those things. Um, as for what's going on with the field right now, um, I just think it's being overstretched, you know, with the insurance running the show, especially in the U S um, I know it, depending on the region, it, it can be different, but in the Northeast, the insurance runs the show. So where our, our clinic is, um, it's five years old, just two, two physical therapists and, um, each year reimbursement rates have gone down, right? So it's kind of like your cable bill every year. They make you pay more, same thing. You got to see more people. So they back you into this corner where you have to emphasize quantity over quality. And, you know, in kind of year five of, of our business, we just pretty much said, we can't do that anymore. Cause if we keep going down this road, the efficiency is going to keep going up. The effectiveness is going to keep going down. So we need to make a decision now. So we decided to, um, you know, instead of kind of being in this gray area of just kind of getting rid of the worst insurances, so to speak, we were like, all right, it's all or nothing. Um, so we wanted to make sure yeah, that we were um, making that decision, you know, for the, the you know, all the patients. We, we, we don't necessarily call it a cash-based model. We call it the, the patient-centered model. Um, and, you know, going back to what Layla was saying, where it's hard to see those underserved people who may not have the money. Um, we're trying to implement as many programs as we can. So even if it's a, you know, we do a one-time consult with you and then we, we, you know, give you exercise programs virtually check in with you, you know, for a, a you know, significantly lower cost. Um, and then just trying to get out in the community and do, do things, um, you know, at different exercise studios and those types of things, trying to reach as many people as we can that way. And then in the clinic, you know, as opposed to seeing 16 to 20 people a day, we're trying to keep it to one an hour. So eight in an eight hour day. Um, so we can really maximize that, that effectiveness. Um, in terms of challenges with this kind of the, the cash-based model we're going towards, um, the biggest thing I said is, is that dealing with that feeling of not being able to help as many people, um, you know, and that's something like, like I mentioned, we're trying to combat as best as we can. You know, I think the other thing is, and people have already touched on this, um, about the people you're working with not being um, kind of all in on their health. They, they're just concerned with their elbow or their knee or whatever. They're not necessarily concerned with their overall health. That's one of the hardest things is, is trying to convey that in some way. And I almost think you, you almost have to sell it in a way. Like you have to be a salesperson. And that was something that when I was in high school, I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I knew I didn't want to be a salesman. <laughs> um, and now I feel like sometimes I'm almost selling health to people. And um, it's, it can be tough. I mean, you're, you're selling something that you know is what's best for them, but you feel like you're, you're almost like selling it in a way that's, you know, maybe over, over hyping it or something like that, but you're not, you, you know, that's just what it feels like. Um, so that's definitely one of those kind of um, weird sensations, I guess you could call it. Um, the other thing that's, that's been difficult in recent weeks is having the conversation about why we're not accepting your insurance with people. You know, they don't get it because in their minds, it's just supposed to cover everything. But the best analogy I can give people in that kind of a situation is, okay, well, you have car insurance for your car, right? But when you need an oil change, the car insurance doesn't cover it and you don't expect it to, you know, so we're trying to be, and not that we're trying to just be in the, the like maintenance phase, so to speak, but we're, exactly. okay. We're, um, you know, we're trying to almost make people members of the clinic as opposed to, Oh, we'll see you for six weeks. You know, we want people to come so we can help them with their, their health journey for life. You know, if, if they need it, you know, so we, we try to get people on, um, certain programs we call continuity programs where, okay, well, let's come in once a month and we'll just kind of follow up, see where you're at, uh, check on you, see, see how things are going in all areas of health. Um, and then with regard to your goals, you know, just making sure that you're on track with where you want to be, your physical activities, recreation wise, and all that kind of stuff. Amazing. Thank you for sharing that, Nick. And I think uh, good on you and your partner for like making the commitment because it's not easy. Like I, I I don't know from it firsthand, like we opted to never take insurance in the clinic um, that I started. And 
it was very similar to the community thing that you're talking about because people didn't know that you could go see a physical therapist to yeah. learn how to deadlift or to you know like take up a, a new skill like if you want to do boxing not because you want to compete but like if you just want to learn that like we can help you with that and people were like what i can come see you for that yeah. and you know like people i, I think if you just ex- they have this box when people come in they have a box this is the what the physio does fits inside this box nothing else is i, I shouldn't even bring up anything else because that's not within the physio box once you have conversations with people and you expand the box of a value that you can deliver to them or help them with then they're like this is very different from what I, from this perception of what I had in terms of what you do or why I should come to see you. And I think there's something very, like we're, open, we're starting this local community called Heart of Hindenburg. And our mission there is to integrate the values of health and community in a local community and essentially create very informal opportunities for people to come see us. Like one of them is just a health, uh, health discovery session. It's an hour long and we're developing this template and it's like, it's, it's tricky because we're basically like, what do you, what, why did you come? Like, why did you, you came to this health discovery session. Cool. So clearly you want help with your health, but like, how do we ask the right questions for them to direct to us why they're coming and what they want? Um, because it might be an injury, but it might also be like, I just don't feel great. Or I hate the work I do. Like, you know, and just having mm-hmm. an informal conversation with people. And one of the things that we're going to do is uh, I'm doing this with a, a nurse who um she's not on this call but her name's emily and she quit nurse she literally was reading why we sleep on a nursing shift at two in the morning and she quit nursing a couple days later she's like this is literally destroying my health um and she's like i can't actually help people as a nurse but i can help people if i do some sort of local project where i can do what i know i should be doing um but you know one of the one of the fun things is like when you what we agreed to is that we're not going to chart or take notes the, we're going to make it really obvious that when someone books a health discovery session, they bring something to take notes with. So the onus is on the individual to take notes and like learn. Uh, and we can even record it and send them the recording. And so it kind of flips things where it's not our job. Like we're not having to prove to any insurance company we're delivering value. If you want to continue coming to see us, you're probably only going to do that if we're actually helping you. So the onus is on us. The, the incentive structure is that if we don't deliver value, um, then people don't continue to come see us. And in fact, if they don't enjoy the first session, we just give them their money back. Um, and I think when you do that, you take a lot of the pressure off, right? Like I'm just there to help this person in whatever capacity it might be. If that's just them lying down or, ha- or playing on a balance beam for an hour and that makes them feel good, you know, let them kind of self-direct it. And I think, um, I think I'm very curious to see how you kind of navigate all the challenges with your clinic, because I think, um, I love what you said about creating a community, not a, not a, um, not an injury clinic. Cause I think yeah. that's so powerful. Like there's so much to unpack there. So thanks for that, Nick. Uh, Marissa, I think you, I don't know if you're on your bike or you're cruising around, but if you'd like to go, it's all yours. I think you're muted. There you go. Okay. Can you hear me guys? Yeah. Yeah. We can okay. Hear you. So, um, what is what I was thinking about what what health is uh, to me in two sentences. So I think uh, I've discovered that health uh, it's the power we have as individuals to to take care of whatever it is uh, we need to either is mentally or physically or in our community. Um, how to help. Uh, not only the community but ourselves i think uh it's it's what is getting lost there we don't we don't know what 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 it's held to each individual uh to us we need to learn how to uh know um our body and our minds and to to learn how to fix it or not fix it just live with it like i told uh ruth uh maybe two weeks ago i've struggled a lot with mental health um I don't know if it's because I'm a recovering addict or or just because I was born this way, but I do everything I can to fix my my health, my mental health, because I know I struggle with it, but I'm aware of it. So the only the only way I can fix it is uh, to know that I have it, and also to to find a way to to better myself and not to get stuck in in my head. Um, 
the challenges I'm seeing in my in my uh, my my perspective about what's happening in my field. Sorry, um, like Diego said, hola Diego. I'm so happy to have a also a Mexican friend over here. You you have no idea when when Ruth told me in the mail and when you um, uh, text me, I I was amazed because I I'm. I'm trying to do that here in Mexico. Whatever everyone's doing in their in their place, um, I'm fighting. I'm fighting here in Mexico to to do something different. And I think that is um, my perspective. Is we are all uh, taught something in physical therapy school that it's crazy. I mean, it's the most I think unhealthy thing we can do. Like whatever they're teaching. It's so unhealthy. I mean, I remember something really small that they told me that they said, um, you cannot engage with, with your patients. You cannot ha uh, have any relationship with, with them or know uh, anything about their background. And now it's crazy crazy to me to, to think that way because if I don't know anything about uh, their past or their hobbies or whatever they do, it's I, I cannot help them. I mean, it's like if, if they just came like a knee, uh, might as well just fix uh, machines. I don't know where it's crazy that we're um, taught to fix uh, like a machine. Like like Diego said, like if you have this um, in this ligament, you do this, this and this. And if you have this, but you don't see a person as a whole. I mean, it's a lot of machine, machine things. And we're, we're not looking at machines. We're looking at at human beings and the struggle i'm i'm looking here in i don't know if it's in mexico it's what i what i've seen here in mexico i have my own clinic because um i don't like the way uh physical therapy is is seen here in mexico um it's crazy how we are like you said uh they don't appreciate uh the the thing we're trying to teach them not because we feel like we're smarter than them, but because we uh, maybe this journey of knowing ourselves has helped us to to develop something um, to help uh, someone else feel better, not only physically, but also like in all areas of their of their like health and and their their well being. Um, the money thing it's it's crazy because here in Mexico, I don't know what's the the charge over there where you guys live but here in mexico if you charge more than 500 pesos you're crazy i mean and it's crazy that in dollars that's like um 30 dollars an hour so it's and you have they don't understand that you have to maintain uh your place where you have your clinic and also your house and also your you're like it's crazy to me that they um they pay, uh, like you said, for doctors and, and stuff because they, gave, they give you something like a pill. But we, we are not able to, to well, I'm, it's not like I'm going to give pills to anybody, but it, it's like, you know what I'm saying? You, you cannot, uh, like I, I read the other day, um, the shoe company, they cannot sell bare feet. That's why they're selling shoes. Nobody can sell uh, bare feet. So... It's how I see it. I cannot sell health. Like, I cannot just sell it to you. I need to teach it to you to understand it first. And then you can you can get what, what's going on with your body first. So that's, the, seconds, that's uh, the struggles I think I've been facing. And, and it's, it's like swimming against the current. Like, maybe people from Canada knows, knows this best because they have a lot of salmon over there. <laughs> but it's like like a salmon. I feel like a salmon swimming against the current. It would be easier just to let go and, and swim with the other fish. But I don't want to. I mean, I really believe in this and 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 I do it because I, I really believe it. So, yeah. Amazing. Thank you, Marissa. And when you're talking about um, that thing about not engaging with your patients, I remember one thing they told me in physio school, which immediately, even in like my mindset at that point, was just like felt weird to me. They're like, you're never allowed to treat your family members. And I was like, hold up, say that one more time. Like I'm learning about health. The primary purpose I'm doing this is so I can help people in my family, let's be real. 
Um, and you're telling me that I'm not allowed to treat my family because it's a conflict of relationship or something like that. I was like, this is wacky. This is way too rigid. Something's fishy here. And so, yeah, I can definitely relate to that. And, and it is like swimming upstream. I mean, anyone that we told uh, Mike and I, that uh, the business model we were using at the clinic, they're like, you're not going to, you're going to go bankrupt. Like, how can you make money by seeing five people a day? And it's like, well, um, we, we spend a lot of time with them. And even though we tell them not to come back, guess what? They end up coming back because they need help at some other point. And they tell all their family to come. Like we're, we, we're booking three weeks in advance. And it's like, so when you do quality over quantity and you develop an actual connection to, to want to engage with someone and like, I would play with patients, it was great. And so they would come back because they had fun, not necessarily because they liked me. Um, they just had a good time and they felt better overall. They felt more confident in their health. Even if nothing changed, they felt more confident that they were in control. And I think, um, you know, at, at, at the outset, I mean, you're trying to put yourself out of business with every person you see, but people are, people are always going to need help. And so it's a different model. It's very counterintuitive. It's like goes against the current game theory where disease, treating people frequently um, and really not actually helping them long term is the most profitable way of doing rehab right now, which is like, that's probably part of the reason we're in such a weird place is because that's what the system incentivizes. Um, but like all of this sort of, you know, this whole notion of people taking responsibility for their health, I think there's like a deeper level to that, right? Like responsibility goes down to response ability. People need to be able to respond. Um, they need the ability to respond to challenges. And if we're not giving them uh, or helping them acquire the ability to respond to challenges, um, then it's kind of unfair. That was crazy, Ruth. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't get electrocuted. <laughs> um, it's not fair to say you need to take responsibility without helping them acquire the ability to respond to challenges. Because at the end of the day, we want them to be able to independently respond to their challenges and, and seek help as needed, uh, but not have complete reliance on people to fix the problems for them. So I think, um, yeah, it's like, it's basically like we're creating a, a totally new mindset in terms of our roles as health providers. So it's a, it's a very, it's exciting, um, but it's also, uh, you know, it will have definitely some challenges. Uh, Ruth, do you want to, do you want to go in terms of sharing um, your perspective of health and then I'll do that and then we'll get into discussing some questions? Yeah, so my heart's racing a little bit. That was so awesome. Um, well, I, there was some, I think I'm not a physical therapist, but I, but I have been to physical therapy and I have a lot of friends who are physical therapists and this is, you know, we're surrounded in the foot nerd program and in the foot collective by health professionals. Um, and so maybe what I could do, Nick, is just kind of kick off the open discussion and just, uh, pick on a couple of things that really struck me during our conversation one of them is that we have this overarching issue, which is that the, the general public, the people who are maybe not, who are coming to see uh, physical therapists for help um, have been conditioned to think of health in a certain way or not in a certain way. So this issue is like so big that we need to come together like on many levels where the physical therapists aren't you know, it, first of all, Linda said something about um, being behind closed doors, sneaking fun to her patients. I mean, that to me is like, yeah. that's so bizarre in my brain. It's like, I, nobody's looking, we can dance. I mean, if that's <laughs> not, if that doesn't just right there tell you that we, there is a, a big picture issue about how we perceive health and like what our what are like cream of the crop people who go to school to help people, you know, like these are, you, we're big hearted people, you care and we want to help, but it's not our responsibility. And just like with nursing and with um, all these professionals where people go into that profession to help other people become burnt out, become unhealthy themselves. Um, and this is not like, I'm, I don't think I'm overgeneralizing here. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that there aren't the, um, the outliers where, you know, Layla is describing some change that are happening. But what I think is that health is so freaking simple. And I learned this a lot from you too, Nick. I mean, I knew it coming into the foot nerd program, but you don't have to 
no physical therapy or go to school for a billion years to understand that your body is a magical, healing, amazing machine. But people have been taught over time not to trust their bodies, then go to physical therapists to fix it. And mm -hmm. so I think this idea about the solution is, you know, heart of Hindenburg, like there need to be more communities where there need to be more community messages like teaching in big, large communal ways about what is the definition of health. It's not that my shoulder is broken, fix it. Um, and then I'll feel better, I'll get out of pain or you know, people are just stuck in the idea that because we're called healthcare professionals that health is just the, the, um, the um, absence of symptoms. Well, people aren't even educated in the big picture that health is thriving and that you're not supposed to break down when you hit 50 or 40 and then that, you, that all over the world people are climbing in trees when they're, they're 90s gardening their own backyard and taking care of themselves and living independently, you know, not, um, you know, wearing diapers, you know, we, Nick and I talked about this, how when I go to the pharmacy, ooh, I'm getting feisty. <laughs> um, <laughs> when I go to the pharmacy, I'm seeing like briefs or like depends or adult diapers, but the marketing is not like a patient in a hospital. It's like a George Clooney looking sexy guy wearing a freaking depend or a woman in high heels. And, and so I think the message is, is, you know, like the physical therapists are having to take on so much when this is a large public issue. So I think in the way of like public health, we should talk about how are we going to get more of the community hubs like Heart of Hintonburg out into the community so that the physical therapists aren't having to sell health. I mean, we're not drug pushers. Mm -hmm. So like why, why, like Nick said, he would, he didn't want to become a salesman. It's just like, um, you know, to draw a quick parallel to the educational system, like professors are having to sell their classes to get high enrollment at university. It's like, well, you didn't want to sell education. You wanted to teach. So, so we have this mismatch, I think, um, idea about health. And then that whole, um, and then also, I think somebody said, oh, Layla was saying about how it's slowly changing. But I don't think there needs to be a slow change. Like it, it needs to happen so much faster and, and it can. That's what I'm learning in the Foot Nerd program. It's like you give people tools and immediately within two weeks, they feel better. You, you get somebody on a beam and myself included, you know, like I've been in pain, joint pain for years. I got on a freaking beam, a piece of a little tiny tool. And within three weeks, I'm out, you know, buzzing around, running around, feeling healthier. And then the body will take over and we have an innate desire to feel good. So anyway, that was like what I wanted to just underscore was that this is a much bigger issue than just physical therapy. And we need to really appeal to how do we uh, address this on a communal level, like in our cities and in our, our counties and our communities. And I love the idea of Heart of Hintonburg and like what that addresses, because now it, when you're actually like on the, pounding the pavement, like talking to people about taking responsibility for their own health. I mean, every day in my yoga classes, that's what I'm saying is like, you've been assigned a body and you get it for the rest of your life and it's your one true asset. And so you should pay attention and give it the respect it deserves. This is your body. It's not, it's, it's your job to take care of it and tell it it's awesome. Otherwise it's not gonna believe that. So thanks Nick for letting me rant for a second. Thanks for the rant. Um, yeah, I think, you know, just Heart of Hindenburg is essentially, I mean, it's, it's got its own branding, but it's essentially, the goal there is to take a very systems-based approach to develop a template so that literally we're going to have a, a playbook, like a standard operating procedure of all the services we offer, how we went about actually doing this. Like we've, I told Emily, let's take this mindset from the very get-go. We're essentially creating a template that any nerd or anyone really, because we just open source it, can take this and be like, I'm going to be the health resource in my community this is how you end up doing that, right? Where you don't even need to have your own space. You could literally approach a gym that aligns on values and have that be your hub. And you're just a community health resource and people, you know, like how do we get people who need the help to find the people who can help? Because the people who can help right now with the majority of things people need help with are not doctors or physical therapists. They just aren't the way that they're trained right now. They can be, but the way that you're trained like right out of the gates. And I have this weird theory that like literally, I think by learning medicine or physical therapy or massage therapy, 
you are partially unlearning health because you're getting further away from the understanding that health is our default state and health is often by subtraction. And what you are learning is addition. Uh, you're learning that the addition of your services or your knowledge is what people need for health. And so it's like, you know, a thought experiment that maybe this, this will be a good discussion topic is like, I used to have a, a spiel that I did with every patient I saw in, in the clinic on, on the first visit. It was about five minutes long. And in that, I basically said, I am not here to do the work for you. This is what my role is. This is what your, this is what my expectation is of you, right? If you actually want to get rid of this, if you just want to get rid of this and feel better short term, this is not the, like we'll go through today, but this is not the right place to just get the short term fix. And I would fire probably 20% of patients because it's just, if they didn't agree with doing the work and we like literally would dial down, like how many minutes per week are you going to put into this? When are you going to do it? What time of day? What reminder are you going to set? Like I would go nitty gritty in the behavior design because then they, they, because they want that. They actually want to do it. But if they don't have the tools to know how to program it and, and plug that into their life, they are probably not going to succeed. Mm -hmm. um, like behavior design and emotional intelligence are two things that if I was taught that in physio school, I would have been 500 X more effective right when I graduated, but nothing about that, nothing about dealing with humans, which are these insanely complex beings and nothing about helping people install behaviors into their life or uninstall them was taught to me. And it's like, that's goofy. That's super goofy. Cause that was my only job. Um, and so this whole thing of, if we created through technology, like if we created a really good five minute video that for example, Nick, so that you don't have to waste time telling people why you don't take insurance, include why you don't take insurance in that video. And everyone that came to your clinic, watched that video before they came to see you. Well, guess what? You just got rid of 20 minutes worth of work of describing to someone what the expectation is and why you don't take insurance and all this kind of stuff. They come in and they're like, let's go. Like, I, this is what these, these are my issues. I understand. I've defined health. Here's my definition of health, right? Like looking back now, I would have told people to come in with their definition of health. They are written on paper so that we can at least get on the same page foundationally. And then it's like, okay, now you understand I'm on your team, but I am not the one who does the work. I'm here to guide you and steer you in the, in, in the direction of doing the right work for, for the time and place you are right now, which will change. Um, and Diego, I think you're right. We focus so much, like, I mean, physio school is all about protocols, right? Uh, like an objective assessment is literally charted every single thing. And you're asking them a billion questions, very few of which relate to health. And you're basically emphasizing that the specifics, the highly specific things about their injury are the most salient things to talk about. Like literally it's in the sheet. Um, whereas if you're actually focusing on health, those aren't the salient things, right? The, the, the important things are, why are you coming to see me? You know, are you familiar with, uh, you know, like the basic framework of the five pillars, right? And for Heart of Hindenburg, the health discovery is going to be, these are the five pillars. Which pillar do you think needs the most love right now? Are you struggling with most? Perfect. Let's forget about the other four for the time being. We'll focus on just this one. What are behaviors you feel you can do to um, optimize that pillar of health? If they don't have them, then we can give them a template for different behaviors they can do and have them choose which one makes the most sense. Like that is a very relatively unstructured compared to a typical orthopedic assessment, um, you know, form, but like that is a true, I think, health interaction where you're letting the person do it. So, so what needs to go into that five minute video? Let's maybe just go like a minute each and say, what would you include? Cause I'll go back and watch this. And then maybe we can put together like a, a PDF, just like talking about all the ideas in five minutes. If they watched a five minute video before they came to see you and you had a chance to preface the ex like create a sense of expectation, what would you include in that video? So let's go around, same order that we did before. Let's maybe start with Jennifer. So the first, so I was thinking about this, um, Nick. There, if you look at other clinics that are already cash based, you can find verbiage on their their websites that you can definitely mm. use. So there's there's a lot to get from that. I do a cash base also, so I completely understand and had the same struggles. Um, but what I think needs to be included in is if you can impress upon them that you're going to look at, it's going to be customized. It's going to be what they need, not what something else says they need. And, mm. and they, you know, as long as you let them know that they're unique people and you're treating them in that unique way, um, you're getting right to the heart of the matter. And so, I mean, to me, that's the, the biggest thing is like, I don't have to do it with someone else. If you can get anywhere else, 
you know, you're not going to get that piece. You're going to get what I'm educated to do and what I can bring you. And so that's, that's building a relationship right there. Amazing. Cool. Diego. Yeah, that, that was uh, awesome. Right. Like, uh, the thing that you all said was pretty like inspiring. Uh, and yeah, I think in my five minute video, I, I will, make a pretty high quality resume about what we just talked about and maybe focus on, on the importance of curios curiosity. Um, mm. Yeah, like we That's have really to, good. yeah, we, we have to start being curious about our bodies, our, like our, um, our environment. And it was super crazy because, uh, when we are were talking about all of these stops, I was writing some some points down, and it's it's crazy for me to see how like the connection works because even though we are separate from kilometers of distance, like we are we are actually thinking so much like so many similar things that I was like when 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 Nick said said the the health seller, like two minutes uh, ago, I was reading, we are health seller, right? So <laughs> yeah, it was crazy for me to realize uh, that connection and that like conscious connection that we are uh, looking for in this group. And that's amazing. So yeah, rather than like, uh, yeah, curiosity, uh, love, I think like open our, our hearts to, to, to feel loved and to express love, uh, it's the key to to wanting to do the things like to do the the homework. <laughs> cool. Yes. Good call, uh, Linda. I think that I would <clears throat> stress in the video for them to come prepared to um, expect that that first session would really be about just talking to them about who they are finding out what's meaningful to them. What, did, what do they still enjoy or used to enjoy that they can't anymore for whatever, and then finding out why, but really to go on a discovery interview, if you will, but really a conversation to be able to have them ready for that. Not necessarily for you to yeah. go through like the standard things that they usually get when on that first eval, like you talked about, all those boxes you have to check off, but really just to come prepared to talk about themselves and to be able to find out what's meaningful to them. Because if you can tap into what's meaningful to them, then, you know, you can, you can easily go from there to find out, you know, like you said, which area of their life is sort of hurting the most or needs the most attention. And then you can go from there and, and come up with a, a plan that will be effective because right out of the gate, you're going to get them to buy into it and look forward to, and get excited about having that part feel better, that area of their life. And, and, and to uh, explain, I guess, in the video that it isn't just about your physical body. It's about all the things we've talked about, all the different components, you know, their nutrition and what do they spend their days doing? Do they ever get outside? Um, you know, how often do they, are they socializing with people or are they just stuck behind a computer all day? All those things that go into play to make them who they are right then and, and, and that feed into how they're feeling, even if they don't realize that yet. So I'd probably stress that. So they kind of came ready for that and weren't all of a sudden sort of put off by, you know, so often like currently I'll I actually sort of, I'm in a supervisory role now. So I'll get complaints from people sometimes, you know, cause they'll call and say, well, all they did was ask me questions and they didn't do anything because they weren't expecting the right thing. Yes. Um, so I think, you know, that video would be important to lay that expectation out there, that invitation for conversation. And people actually like talking about themselves. So I don't think it would be hard. I think you just need to get them to be ready that that's what that first session would be about. Yes, that's a, that's very important because when you set the expectation, there's no uh, disconnect between what they thought they were going to get and what they ended up getting. And they're almost going in prepared to tell their story and to really get clarity. Like what I piloted these one-on-one uh, -on -one sessions online to see like, can we actually do uh, help someone online um, digitally from a distance? Cause I was like, I wonder if you can actually be effective with that. And I remember I treated, uh, I worked with a psychologist. She was a psychologist in the UK 
And the first I gave her, I gave everyone homework questions. Like, what are your top three values? Why do you want to schedule this call? And what are you hoping to get out of this? Like, those are just simple questions. Like I want to understand. And the first thing she said was, I've seen a lot of health specials over the past three years. No one's ever asked me any of those questions. And it was like, she was like shocked. She was like, no one's ever asked me that. And that's really important <laughs> to be, yeah. to have a, like an effective um, interaction. So, so yeah, I think asking questions and if you set the expectations that like, I need to understand you in order to guide you in the right direction, um, then they go into it, you know, knowing that they're not expecting to have their shoulder massage. They're expecting to tell their story so that they can be guided in the right direction. So yeah, that's yeah. awesome. And it's, it's also uh, more about like, like still, I think people would come thinking, oh, I'm gonna tell you all about what hurts. And right. how, you know, what I think happened to make it hurt. But it's really like, I, I just want to know, I just want to learn about you as a whole, mm -hmm. who you are and yep. what makes you tick. And yeah, then that's a great those point. things will kind of be explained, you know, in that, in that discovery. Yeah, I remember one of my favorite professors said, if you ask the right questions, uh, the patients will tell you exactly what they need to do um, instead of you having to guess. And I thought that was really powerful. Uh, Linda, Linda Drummond. You got to unmute yourself again. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's okay. Um, I don't know what else to add to that. I, I love all of that. Um, um, it, the video would just include so much of what, what health is because I, I personally feel it's just so lacking in um, mm. people's perception of what's important. Um, so it would um, go in depth um, to all of those, those different pillars. And um, like the person that just spoke before me, um, making them very aware of, of what's um, requested of them, make them look inside. I think that's so lacking. Everyone is so busy and um, just focused on that one body part. They, they just honestly have no clue of what's actually going on in, inside them. Um, so making them do the mental work of, of thinking um, of the bigger picture and um, yeah, that's yeah. a huge part of it. Because <clears throat> I think the point of it is like a, a box expanding uh, like setting their expectations to expand the box of what, uh, let's call it a health guide, right? You can be a health guide with a specialty in physical therapy. But if you're just a physical therapist, you have a box. If you're a health yeah. guide with a specialty in physical therapy, you have a way bigger box. You have a subset specialty that you learned in school. But I think this whole notion of everyone, everyone working in health, being a health generalist with a specialty in medicine or with a specialty in physical therapy, um, I think that's the direction we need to go so that we all have a fundamental basic understanding of health broadly, even if you're not going to spend all your time on mental health, like you should know some very simple heuristics um, in terms of like, you know, spending a couple of minutes to yourself each day breathing like that. You don't have to be a psychologist to, to let someone know that that's a good thing to try. Um, and if someone needs a psychologist, then you can refer to a psychologist that hopefully is also a health generalist with a specialty in psychology. So it's like really just set the expectations that this is not just a shoulder appointment. Like I'm a health guide. We can talk about your shoulder and we can well, surely, if that's it's giving you pain, we're going to deal with it. But there's a bigger picture to kind of work on here. So yeah, uh, Layla? Um, yeah, I, th <laughs> I think that I would want to talk or yeah, introduce the concepts of social determinants of health. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar with that. Um, it's like, it's a public health model, but it just talks about the different factors of a person's life that can affect their health. So it's um, like neighborhood and environment, uh, education, uh, work, and um, like social and community context. So different factors like bubbles that affect health. Um, so kind of explaining like what you were just talking about, Nick, and then also the stages of change model. So again, I don't, I don't know uh, if everyone is familiar with this, but um, there are five stages and it's pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, and main maintenance. 
So um, I think that would be like a good foundation to kind of like, well, if you're not even in the contemplation phase, like we're not going to be successful with your, your, with your therapy or with your rehab or health process. So um, yeah, explaining that again, kind of just like setting the expectations um, so that they know. Yeah, that's a great idea. And I think there's I don't know if that's in a five minute before you come to see me video, but surely there should be a foundational database of like quick videos, five minutes, less than 10 minutes for sure, but like even five minutes because people's attention spans are like yay big now. Um, where if there was like one about stages of change or deter social determinants of health or just broadly like what is health and go through the five pillar framework. If there's a really, if there's an easily accessible database of high quality videos that anyone can watch, like nothing will prevent you from watching this. If you have a, the internet on a device, you can watch this. That was kind of the intention behind TFCF. So Layla, maybe we can chat about that. Cause I think if we made these foundational videos accessible and available and democratize them to everyone um, and they can just improve their awareness enough to get a broader understanding of health. I think that's very, very powerful. Uh, Nick, what would you put in that video? Sounds like that video um, might be relevant for you. <laughs> so I think the big thing would be that rehab and health aren't separate entities. Rehab is really just, you know, a point in time on the health timeline, right? So mm -hmm. it's not, we can't separate the two. We always need to address health. And I think that would be kind of the big thing for a lot of the, you know, the potential patients, clients coming in. Um, and then I think the other thing I'd, I'd want to put in there is because a lot of people refer to um, you know, their exercises or whatever they're given for their take home as like homework or chores. And it would be, no, we're not giving you chores to do. We're giving you small, you know, habit changes that will are likely more sustainable, you know, that can be implemented for life that, you know, you can start right now today, as opposed to, oh, you got to do this chore, you know, three times a day for the next six weeks, and then you're good, you know? Mm -hmm. So just kind of like reframe that mindset. Uh, uh, based around like homework or chores. Yes, that's very powerful because it's like you're helping people change the way they live their life instead of just giving them yeah. <laughs> homework yeah. and then exactly. blaming non-compliance if they don't do the boring stuff. Exactly, yeah. Um, yeah, very cool. Marissa? Yeah, maybe uh, we can do something about whatever, what everyone's talking about, about making sure they know what they're coming into. Uh, maybe it's hard to for them to understand what we're doing because it's really different of where what they are um, doing it before. So we, we could mm -hmm. do something to maybe get to know them and maybe give an example on ourselves and maybe do it first and make the video of what I like to do and how I like to do it. And then after, uh, maybe tell them if they can give us the same feedback we're giving them but uh, getting to know their hobbies or what they like, or maybe just uh, about a little bit of their personal life to know um, what we're talking about right now, that it's important to know that why, what they're doing so we can know how to, how to treat it. Yeah, good point. And I think like the essence of, you know, we've got two minutes left and I want to be sensitive with everyone's time, but the essence of that is if we create a new role. Let's say we're creating a new identity for a role that hasn't yet been created, which is the health guide. Um, and if we called it something weird, like role X, how, do, how in five minutes, how would you explain what someone who does role X does and what are they going to do with you the first time you meet them, right? If they come in with zero understanding, because let's be real, people literally have zero understanding of what a health guide would do, right? They're used to like, well, are you a, are you a doctor? Are you a physio? It's like, no. The health guide. So there's this new thing that we're creating a uh, scope of practice for and sort of like a, a set of expectations for how do we articulate that in a short period of time so that we can essentially create a new identity for a health guide. And so maybe that's some food for thought for everyone um, to kind of work on that. And I think there's also you know, this whole notion of telling your story to, to let people know who you are and why you do what you do. There's something like this is the new way we're going to um, graduate people from the Footner program. Um, and graduation really is just a point in a ritual signifying a point in time that you've completed a, a certain thing, which is, you know, um, like that's a big deal. You put in a year's worth of effort to learn about health. And the new way to graduate is tell your story. Tell your story of why you do what you do, um, what you love to do, 
and you know what you've been learning or what what has changed in your mindset when it comes to health in the past x amount of time when someone watches that if they can meet you digitally um and you can effectively help them virtually i mean obviously meeting in person is great but the reality is the world changed uh and we can't make the omelet back into eggs now so that like the virtual style of connection is going to be here to stay um and so if you can tell your story and you can give someone a set of expectations and, and they can relate to that, um, you can probably work with a lot of people um, without even having to be in the same city as them. And so, you know, that's how we get people, that's how we get people who need help to go to the helpers is create a digital system that brings them to the right place. Um, so anyway, thank you everyone for, it's 1030, so we'll wrap this up. Thank you everyone for such an awesome discussion. It's always great hearing stories. And I think, you know, number one, sometimes you get perspectives that you, um, that weren't on your radar before, but if anything, it just makes you feel less alone that it's like, there are other people who do these jobs that aren't super happy or don't feel really confident they're able um, or, or trained to do like what they could potentially do. And I think like every massive problem is a massive opportunity and our health has been a big opportunity for a long time. And I think it takes a group of people to think of ways to you know, capitalize on an opportunity in that to give scalable change, you need a bunch of people, basically. It takes a village. And I think, um, thank you all for taking the time today. And Ruth will make this recording available eventually. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm gonna rewatch it and take some notes because um, I think there's a lot of valuable stuff that was said. And it's just a matter of sorting through it and then um, getting a little bit more clarity um, by letting it go through the brain a bunch of times. So um, yeah. anything anyone wants to say in closing before we wrap this up? Thank you all for taking the time. Thank and you. I hope you have a great rest of your Saturday. And Ruth, I hope you don't get you. Uh, electrocuted by lightning. Safe. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah, have a good rest of your week. And we'll talk when we talk. Maybe we'll do another one of these in a couple months and we'll see uh, where we're at, what we've learned. And uh, we'll go from there. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Have guys. a great day. Bye. Bye, everyone.